everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the introduction. So as Ruben said, my name is Fernando Samaya. I work as a research associate in Holland Lab at the NC State University. Uh, today, I will share with you some of the results that uh, uh, from some of my project in my postdoc. And the name of my presentation is Inbreeding Depression in Maize and Teosinte, Domestication as Shaping Force. So I have split my presentation in five parts. First, I will give a, a briefly introduction and I, I will comment some of the basic concepts of breathing and breathing depression, um, the Ocinte and Maitland races. And then I will talk about the, uh, we'll give some background of the experiment. And then I will talk about the phenotypic data and then the genotypic data. And then I will discuss some of the results and some of the conclusions that we draw from this experiment. So let's start talking about that inbreeding. So what inbreeding is, it's a refer to the mating between relative individuals. And the primary effect of inbreeding is the departure of Harry Weinberg genotype frequencies toward an excess of homozygote. So the major consequence of inbreeding is that it increases the likelihood of bringing together genes from common ancestor due to, to a reduction of genetic variance. So the diagram here in the left the, uh, it's an example of, of how by crossing relative individual, we can increase the probability to having a common, a gene from a common ancestor. So I want, to, I want also to mention that there is another force that creates similar, uh, a similar effect in a population by accumulating a homozygote, uh, that is the random genetic drive. Uh, it also causes a reduction in genetic diversity due to the loss of alleles which leads to an increasing homozygosity as well. Uh, there are several, uh, initially that was described by Charlie Darwin in 1876 in his work, The Effect of Cross and Self-Fertilization in the Vegetable Kingdom. But there are also several examples in animal kingdom as well. For example, this is a picture of a uh, red deer that is suffering so, of brachinaltia which is an even alignment of the upper and lower jaw. This is another example of um, in fishes. And here is a, an example that we observed in one of the population that, that we were working with. And this is a red recessive deleterious genes that is affecting plant height in, in maize. Um, but there are also some other examples in human, uh, uh, particularly some of the royal families in, from, from Europe. So those negative example, uh, negative effects from inbreeding is what we know as inbreeding depression. And that is defined as the reduction in, in vigor and reproductive success from inbreeding. So in this picture here, uh, I want to show that inbreeding depression is going in the opposite direction of another complex phenomenon, uh, the heterosis. So here, if we have two genetically different parents, by crossing those parents, we got a, a and if one progeny that have a, 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 a superior uh, quality from the, from the parents, um, that is the heterosis. But as we started to do selfing in, that, in those plants, we can observe a reduction of that vigor. And that is in brain depression operating in the opposite direction as heterosis. There are two genetically distinct explanations about this phenomenon. And the first one is that increased in homocycosity or partial recessive de detrimental mutation. The other one is an increased homozygosity for allele at the side with heterozygous advantage. But in the scientific community, the first one is the more accepted. So we study uh, inbreeding depression in two grasses, in Teosinte and maize. Uh, Teosinte is a wild grass endemic to Mexico and Central America. And maize was domesticated from Teosinte approximately nine thousand years ago in the Southwestern Mexico. Uh, so in this, in this picture here, I am showing the, differ the morphological difference between two species. But uh, what I really want to highlight here is that is one of the main questions that we ask us in this project and what, how we bring the pressure change when it went through the year of domestication of in other words, how we bring the pressure was altered by domestication. That is the, the main question that uh, we wanted to ask in this, uh, in this project. Uh, so mainland races have been maintained as open pollinated population by farmers, uh, having the subject of a strong selection 
for kernel and your types. That is evident when we saw when we see all the different lamb races, all the colors and shapes that we we can see uh, so far in, in in Mexico and Central America. That is because they have been so, targeted to different uh, persons of selection by, by humans. So the main question here in this study uh, are this: the fair one, how has the domestication bottleneck at differences in selection and population forces impacted the genetic load and in breeding depression in maize versus teosinte? So the other question is, has the genetic architecture changed? Or in other words, do large effect variants contribute more to in breeding depression in maize versus teosinte? So those are some of the questions that we, we, we want to answer here with, with, in this project. So before to go directly to, to explain my experiment itself, uh, I want to mention that this experiment was part of the old Pansia project. For those who don't know, uh, who don't, that don't know what Pansia project was, uh, Pansia project was a multi-institutional project in which there were several institutions working together in collaboration to advance the knowledge of quantitative genetic in maize. Um, the part I was involved in was focusing in the study of biology of rare allele in maize and its wild relative. There were two parallel projects, one in Teosinte and one in maize. The one in maize was carried out in Wisconsin. Uh, it was headed by John W. Uh, the main actors of this part were uh, Chie Yang, uh, well known as CJ as well, and Chiu Chen. And the part in maize was carried out in, in, in NC State, headed by Jim Howland. Um, Bodhi Lucolo was one of the first person who started to work in, in, in this population, and then it was inherited by myself. Um, so basically, it was a, a work side by side with, with those guys uh, in order to generate uh, and analyze unique data to answer questions related with the genetic architecture before and after domestication of maize. But also, we wanted to ask. To, to answer questions related with the genetic architecture in inbreeding depression and maize compared with its wild relative. Also, I wanted to mention that there are there were two phases in each of the parallel project. In the first phase, we study one population in Teosinte that was collected in Balsas and one population in maize uh, that was uh, Expeño. In the second phase, we study four different populations of maize and four different populations of Teosinte. Today, I will talk, only talk about the phase one because it, uh, those are the results I want to share with you today. So the, the founders of those populations were, were sampled in Mexico in this region. Um, the population that we sampled from for Teosinte was a proxy of the original population that gave rise of um, of maize in the in the Balsas Valley. And the population of Tuxpeño was a, a proxy of the original population of maize that evolved from Teosinte approximately 9,000 years ago. So those founders were planted in Florida, in this part, in, in Homestead particularly. Um, we developed the, the, the population was developed here and we evaluated the, the pregnant population as well in this region. So now I will describe the, the mating design we used in, in maize. So we sampled 55 founder for, for Tuxpeño, and we did 11 groups of five plants. Into each of the group, we collected the pollen, and we did a bulk. We did bulk, we, we pollinated the, the same five plants. So we got a pre, we got in itself and all groups. Um, those ears were harvested and were planted in subsequent year. For example, in 2013, we planted three tons and plants. And in 2014, we planted another three tons. In total, we planted six tons of plants for, for the whole experiment. Um, and the planting, we only know the female parent, but we didn't know the male parent. But I will talk more about this later in, in my presentation. We also took a tissue sample for each of the parents and each of the progeny uh, to do genotyping. So here is the, the big picture of the project. Here, I just grouped all the tasks um, in, in three different boxes. Uh, in the first box, I listed the, the tasks related with the, the field experiment and data collection in, in Homestead, Florida. And in the purple box, 
uh, I listed the type of genotype we used in this um, in this project, and they are GBS in parent and, and progeny, whole genome sequence in parent, and also skin sequencing in, in some of the progeny. And here in this box uh, are some of the generic ana analysis that we did by combining the genotypic and the phenotypic data. Uh, with this, we, we answered uh, the question that uh, I already mentioned before. So here are some of the pictures of the experiment. Uh, this is a uh, homestead. Um, this is one of the experiments of Florida. This is actually John Dobley working through the road. This is me planting core, and this is one of the experiment in Teosinte, and this is land races. Every plant was sampled for DNA and target for phenotyping. And all the ears that we harvested were moved to, to Raleigh for, for score the, the ear trait data. This is just a picture showing the boxes that contain the tissue sample that we sent to Cornell for genotyping. So overall, we scored more than 40 traits in this experiment, but we selected 18 traits related with domestication. Um, those traits were grouped in three different subgroups. Uh, the one in orange are the traits related with vegetative uh, and flowering time. And the one in the middle are traits related with uh, environmental responses. And um, these in green are traits related with reproduction. So here I will start talking about the, the genotype. Um, and this is uh, the first data we started to work with is uh, GPS. Um, so this is one of the biggest challenge that we really faced in this spray when we started to do analysis. Um, that it was because GBS is genotype calling from low deep sequence information. So the first question we ask us here is, can we use GBS successfully in our experiment? Um, well, the issue here is that GBS, as I said before, is low coverage sequencing and that leads to high error rate uh, when we call heterozygote. We know that inbreeding depression were successfully when we use it in inbred light, but that was not our case because we were working with outcrossing population. So the second question we asked us here was whether can we use any imputation algorithm to impute our data? Well, typically imputation software assume that genotype calls are correct and are concerned in, with filling missing data, but they don't correct the data when they are incorrectly calling. So, I mean, we can use any algorithm, but that is not appropriate for this population. So we came here with the, with the, with the conclusion that we needed an imputation approach that not only fill the missing data, but correct false homozygote calls that are truly heterozygote. So we spent a considerable time trying to solve this part, but finally the solution came from one of the collaborators in, in Cornell, and this is Peter Bradbury. Um, just I, here, I want to give all the, the credit to Peter because he was the, the one who, who had the idea and wrote the, the algorithm. Um, with this skin, I will explain how, how the algorithm work. So let's start saying that we had GBS data in, in the parent, and we had GBS data in the progeny. We have missing data in both data set, parents and progeny, and we have incorrect missing, uh, sorry, incorrect data uh, calling in, in the parent, but also in the progeny. So parental progeny, parental genotypes provide expectation for progeny genotypes, and in the same time, progeny segregation provide expectation for parental progeny, but also for sibling progeny uh, genotypes. The other complementary uh, information we use it here was the link and disequilibrium, and that provides information sharing among marker. So that basically that was a, a hidden mark of chat model. Uh, the first information that Peter needed to run the algorithm was the, um, the parentage. So before I mentioned that, that when we planted, we only knew the, the female parent, but with the raw GBS data, we were able to estimate the, the full parentage in the population. So that was the first data that we used to, to, to correct and impute the data. Then we, we estimated genomic relationship metrics. Um, at that point, we were able to, to, do, to estimate the, the variance component. And that was the, first, the, the topic of the first paper. 
this is the, the CJ paper. Um, I included one of the results here. Um, what I really want to highlight here is that IT variants in maize was depleted by domestication. So I will explain what this graph is about. So in the X axis, we have each of the traits that we evaluated in, in only in the population, and they are grouped in three different groups, subgroups. Uh, each of the bar represents the proportion of the phenotypic variant. I explain it uh, for each of the traits. Um, the, the red color represents the proportion of the phenotypic variant attributable to additive variant, which is basically the narrow sense irritability. Narrow sense irritability is, is a, a standardized measure of the additive variant, so that is basically the same. Um, the, the green color represents the proportion of phenotypic variants attributable to dominant variants, and the, the one in, in, in blue is the, the proportion of the variants attributable to G by E interaction. Variant. So in general here, the Ocente population poses higher level of heritable variation than our maize and race population. That suggests that domestication partially was depleted genetic variants for those traits that were the target for human selection. Um, yeah, another interesting thing to, to highlight here is that despite the overall depletion of Irritability in maize or maize and races still poses considerable amount of irritability for most of the trait. So now I will talk about the, the other types of genotype we use it in this project. Um, this is whole genome sequence. So first, uh, before I mentioned that we, we did whole genome sequence in the parent, both in, in maize and teosinte, that was, gen that was generated in the lab of Ross, uh, Jeff Rossibara. Um, so the next, the next step here was to do the, the facing those, uh, the genotype in, in the parent. But here we needed uh, information from the progeny. That is why we did the scheme sequencing in some of the, the progeny. For example, we selected some self progeny that had a, a very good uh, coverage in the parent. So with that information, we were able to face in the, the whole genome sequence the SNPs from in the parent. And the next step was to do the projection of those data onto the progeny. But um, first we needed the breaking point of recombination for all the progeny. And that was one of the output that we obtained from Peter when, when, when he ran the, the imputation algorithm. So then we were able to project the whole genome sequence the SNPs of the parent onto the progeny. And that resulted in around that, uh, 18 million and 21 million of whole genome sequence SNPs for teosinte and maize and races, respectively. We used this data for in, in our second, uh, for analyzing the, the, the arch genetic architecture of those populations, and that was published in, in our second paper. And those are some of the results that I will, I will share here. So in this graph, uh, this is the QTL summary that from, from GWAS. Those are each of the, of the group of traits. Um, the bars in the, in the very right are the summary for, for the number of QTL that were detected from GWAS. The, the one in orange is for teosinte and this is for maize. So what is very evident here is that in general, there is a substantial reduction of QTL number after domestication. Um, in this graph, uh, I have the relationship between the effect site and the minority frequency for the significant uh, QTL detected from GWAS. In this graph, in the, in the X axis, uh, we have the minority frequency of each of those SNPs. And in the Y axis, it is standardized additive effect. So here, in overall, the large effect of QTL, most of them have minority frequency, low minority frequency for both the species. So that means that most of the large effect QTL detected in G was are due to, to rare alleles. So now at this point, we know that rare alleles are, impo are important to, sh to shape those traits for related with domestication. This is some of the, the first analysis that we started to, to do uh, to compare the inbreeding depression in maize and teosinte. Um, here in this, uh, in this graph, the, the big message here is that maize has more inbreeding depression than teosinte. Um, in the graph, 
the one in the top are for Teosinte. I choose three three of the trade, but that is we observe most uh, the same mostly in all the in all the trades. So the one in the bottle is for Teosinte for maize. The orange boxes represent the distribution of the trade across the 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 Ocrot family, and the one in green are the distribution of the trade across the self families. Delta is the coefficient of inbreeding depression. Um, so well, what we can see here is that in maize, maize is more susceptible to any single event of selfing. So that means that there are more inbreeding depression in maize than teosinte. And now we came here with another question on that. Does maize have more deleterious or lethal variants than teosinte? So um, we split this in another, in, in two separate questions, and we did analysis to answer each of them. So this is one of those. Um, first, I will repeat again the, the question, does maize have more deleterious variants than teosinte? Let's start first with a couple of facts. So we know that largest effect QTL have rare allele, as we saw in the in the in the Chiu paper. And the other fact is that it was lacked of power to detect moderate effect. Uh, I will talk why this is a fact in, in this slide later. So now we know that we cannot detect those 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 QTL with the G was so we turned on uh, we turned our gave to, to the private alleles. And the question was how important are private deleterious alleles that are carried only by single parent? So we proposed um, a novel linkage scan that we call rare allele scan. That test each genetic map position for the effect of one parental allele compared with all other parental. Basically, what we are testing here is a, a single parental allele defined by identical by descent instead of the effect of effect of a sniffed allele defined by identical in a state. So here is an example. I, I comparing I, I I this is an example for plant height. Um, each of the columns in this graph represent each of the 10 chromosomes. In the left side, I have the lot score uh, coming from the rarely scan, and in the right side is the negative logarithm from the p-values from GWAS, from GU paper. Um, the solid line represents the rarely scan, the significant QTL detected by from, from RAS. Um, the dot are the the, the, the significant need from G was. So we identified the same uh, large effect QTL as we did in G was. For example, here in the chromosome seven, we have a, a very large effect QTL that is affecting plant height. We were able to detect it both with G was and with grass. But also we detected additional QTL that in which we were not able to detect with G was. For example, here in the chromosome two, we have a significant QTL in which we don't have any heat from GWAS. And that is because this rare QTL has a moderate effect. And that is why I, I said here that GWAS uh, lacks of power to detect moderate effect QTL. So that is an evidence that we lack the power in GWAS. Um, coming back to the question to whether we have a more deleterious earlier in maize, than teosinte, so the, the question is no, we have more deleterious alleles in teosinte, which is surprisingly, because I, I just saw in my previous slide that we have more inbreeding depression in maize compared to teosinte, so we expected the, the opposite. So the other, another uh, interesting result from, from the rare allele scan was this. In this graph, I am showing the, the, the proportion of variant explained by the, the QTL, the, by the rare QTL detected in each of the traits. And we are comparing with the proportion of variant explained by the polygenic background. In this case, the polygenic background were, was modeled by using 50 principal component mar uh, coming from market data. So in general, we explain more proportion variant uh, uh, with the polygenic uh, background in comparison with the, the variant that we are ex explaining with the with the rare QTL. And that is more strong here in, 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 in the in maize. Um, so that suggests that in brain depression is most po more polygenic in, in maize than in teosinte. Um, yeah, uh, 
that in, in a sense, this kind of bad news for people that are trying to do breeding from 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 our races because the genetic load is more spread in the genome and probably probably that would be more difficult to, to do genomic uh, breeding from from our races even if we are using genomic selection but that is another topic that I will not talk here I just wanted to mention so coming back to the another another question whether uh, does might have more liter variant than Teosinte. So we can here with another analysis to, to test that. Um, that is a linkage scan for segregation distortion. Uh, another reason that we, we did this analysis is because we strongly believe that the literal allele may have been purged from our cell family before they could be contributing to improving the pressure of the traits that we were measuring in adult plant. That is, not all seeds germinated and survived to maturity. Uh, we believe because that is possible due to little recessive alleles that are present in the population. So the way to test that is by doing this analysis. Uh, here in this graph, each of the column, again, represent each of the chromosome in maize and teosinte. In the egg axis, I uh, uh, have the, the length of each of the chromosome in, in semi-morgan. And in the left side is the minor logarithm from the p-value coming from the chi-square test. And in the right side uh, is the ID of, um, of the cell families in which we detected segregation distortion regions. So overall, we detected three different uh, significant uh, segregation distortion regions in three different chromosomes in three different cell, in, cell families in, in maize. And we detected 16 segregation distortion regions in seven chromosomes in 11 cell families in, in Teosinte. The, the blue arrows are indicating where the, the regions are detected. Another interesting result here is that all the segregation distortions that we saw in those regions are against either one or two homozygous classes. For example, here in this graph, uh, those are these status of each of the oplotypes we tested. Um, each of the dots represent each of the cell families, both in maize and teosinte. So we can see here that the, the segregation is against either one or two of the homozygous classes. That means that when those alleles are in homozygous in the population, they are lethal. So that is why they probably are killing the plant before we could score it in our, in our population. Uh, so coming back to the to the question that whether there is more lethal in maize than in teosinte, again the, the 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 result is surprisingly because we we found more lethal alleles in teosinte than in maize. This is another interesting analysis that we uh, we we did uh, thanks to to one of the the collaborators, uh, Marcus Stettler from from Germany, and this is a genomic evolutionary rate profile of GARB comparison between Teosinte versus, versus maize founder. So here is part of the analysis. I have two, two graphs in the left. This is the mean per site burden per, per individual, and the one in the, in the right is the total lot per, per individual. So from this graph, we can see that Teosinte variants have larger deleterious effect than maize. Um, from this graph, we can see that maize parents have higher genetic load than Teosinte parents. This is kind of tricky, but I will try to explain it here in this text. So the, the effect of each of the mutation carried in maize is smaller than the effect of teosinte because the allele, the allele frequency of the mutation are more common in maize. But when we calculate overall lot size where the border is, it is higher in teosinte than maize. So we can see that each maize parent is more likely to carry the literal allele in many locals comparison with the parents of Teosinte. So that is that explains why we can see more, more QTR uh, in Teosinte than the one that we saw in, in, in maize. Um, so now uh, these are my conclusions. Uh, so the first one is that Teosinte has more deleterious and little variants than maize. In brain depression is more polygenic in maize than teosinte. The literal variant have a smaller effect, but higher frequency in maize versus teosinte. And most variants for in brain depression appear to be due to 
polygenic variant with a small effect that are difficult to detect with either DGWAS or rare leo scan. And they are also not easy to forget by national, but natural select, natural selection. Yeah, there are the, there is a handful of other interesting analyses that we included in this publication that is in bioarchive, but that was already uh, accepted for publication in Plus Genetics. So that is going to be published in the next weeks. So now I want to thanks to all the members of the Holland Lab and all the collaborators that, that participated in this, this project. And 